So our next talk is from Kevin Wright, who's a, an assistant professor at Dartmouth College. Before that, he was a postdoc at JQI, where he did some really pioneering experiments with, with bosons and rings, with including junctions. And we've heard a lot about that already in talks so far this week. At Dartmouth, he's been focusing on fermionic quantum gases. And today, he's going to tell us about persistent currents in rings of ultra-cold fermionic atoms. Thank the organizers. This has been tremendous fun to be able to sit in and listen to all of these talks. And uh, also very nice to be able to follow Giacomo. I believe we had, a, as he said, we had a very fun conversation yesterday about uh, a lot of mutual interests. Um, I'm leading off here on my title slide with what is becoming, I think, an increasing theme <laughs> with these uh, spiral interference patterns uh, formed by rings uh, carrying currents around them. Um, and I should, I guess, say before I get going, this uh, work was in fact uh, funded by the NSF. Um, and we've been working on this for some time, but I've, I've been flying a little bit under the radar, maybe only and now really starting to show what we've been up to. So I'll do my best to give you an idea. Um, where's my, there we go. So I will spend a good portion of the talk uh, discussing our experimental methods, how we actually go about creating our rings, inducing currents and detecting them, which the detection portion is usually the most challenging uh, part as uh, Giacomo found out as well. Um, I will primarily be talking about observations that we've made uh, pertaining to uh, taking advantage of the fact that we can tune the interactions in the system and uh, creating a ring and driving it normal and bringing it back to the superfluid phase and the sorts of things we see when we do that. Uh, before getting into go, getting into that, I will spend a little bit of time on background, uh, uh, just making sure I'm not losing any of uh, the graduate students who are possibly in the in the mix here. And I, I'm going to do a little bit less of that than typical, since I think that uh, so much a wonderful amount of background was just given in the previous talk. I don't have to cover everything. Um, and I'll finish up the talk by describing, and hopefully won't get too speculative, on things I think we'll be able to do. Uh, given what we've seen our capabilities are at the moment with this kind of a system, a fermionic ring. Okay, so uh, it's, it's, this is more of a case of preaching to the choir, I think, in this setting that uh, one can do interesting things, taking uh, quantum materials and putting them into circuit configurations. But uh, I do like to go back and talk about the history of this a little bit uh, for multiple reasons. One, it gives me a chance to talk about the fundamental physics uh, and, and make sure that's clear. And secondarily, to remind myself not to be too proud of myself for what I've done and that uh, many of the things that we've been working on in cold atoms have been done long, long ago in solid state systems. And there's still a great deal to learn from those experiments. Um, I've only picked out two particular historical cases here, I think, for specific reasons. Uh, one is uh, this famous experiment done in 1962 by Little and Parks, where if you take a thin-walled superconducting cylinder in a ring, uh, you know, basically bias it with a magnetic field uh, perpendicular to the surface, and measure the critical temperature, you will see that, that is, the critical temperature is suppressed. And there's a periodicity of the suppression of the critical temperature that's periodic in, uh, and this was important at the time, in H over two times the electron charge. Uh, one of the first very strong indications of pairing actually being important in superconductors. And the reason I bring that up is that a lot of my interest in actually putting fermions into a ring is not so much, I mean, I think there, there will be interesting applications for sensing, but I actually am more interested in, in some sense in turning the system in uh, to interrogate itself and see if we can do things to learn more about quantum antibody physics by clever arrangements of things and doing transport measurements. I think there are some opportunities for making measurements of things like the response of the system to uh, applied flux. There are, there are well known effects, such as the uh, de Haas van Alphen effect, the magnetic susceptibility in systems is modulated as per the uh, applied flux or even the resistivity in the Shubnikov de Haas, de Haas effect. Um, I think that may give us some interesting information about, uh, about uh, quantum materials in this sort of setting. I also want to make sure it's clear, since I'm going to be talking about persistent currents, this is not just something that happens in superfluid systems. One can have, in fact, persistent currents in a normal uh, metal ring, as long as the coherence length of the electrons going around some closed path, uh, as long as the coherence length is long enough compared to some closed path. And there's some 
uh, you know, very interesting related results in other talks, uh, thinking about uh, transport in, in uh, 1D systems. And we'd love to get a look at some of this, although this is out of scope for the time being. The really relevant thing though is uh, if you have a coherent system and you've got a multiply connected geometry, you have to think about the coherence of the wave function around that uh, geometry. And that leads to things like quantization of flow. And depending on the energetics of allowing flux into or out of that circuit, you may have situations where the flux, uh, where, where the current is metastable and cannot decay. It's not the thermodynamic ground state, but maybe very, very long lived. Um, and some of the interest with this is that when you do start to play with the system, creating a weak link, for example, as was done in this early work, Silver and Zimmerman, uh, you, you see that uh, at some point you reach a critical current or otherwise do something uh, and you are able to see flux come in and out. This is often a very sharp event. This is often, it's, it's very discreet. Uh, and this is behind the reason why superconducting circuits are in fact so useful often as sensors is that they can be made exquisitely sensitive to tiny changes in current or tiny changes in the applied flux. Uh, and, and trying to realize this in atomtronic circuits is uh, maybe an important piece of the game. Um, so this was some of the early work done at NIST, uh, where we did create a sodium BEC, uh, placed it into a ring, uh, create, created a uh, weak link in it, and saw that, yes, we have uh, quantized uh, current states and that we could induce transitions between them. Much more has been done on this uh, subsequently, you know, many better experiments uh, uh, showing even further that these sorts of systems can in fact behave very much like superconducting circuits. And I won't even begin to attempt to review all of that right now. Um, but I, I think, uh, again, as I said, we shouldn't be too proud of ourselves. You know, I, you know, we, we've just started looking at uh, fermions in these sorts of circuit systems and you know, ultra cold fermions in these sorts of uh, circuit systems. But this has been done for quite some time in the context of helium three, even before, uh, anyone ever got around to condensing uh, fermions into a superfluid phase in an ultra-cold atom experiment. Uh, helium-3, you, know, you, you can create a situation where you have tiny orifices and create a, a, a DC squid and uh, measure rotation. And interesting point here, I think, in terms of leveraging technology and all these sorts of things, point out that the detection of the, uh, the excitation in, in this superfluid ring was done by measuring the displacement of an aluminized membrane uh, that affected essentially a tank circuit and was sensed by a superconducting squid. Again, the in incredible sensitivity of the squid was necessary to even realize this experiment looking for this result in, uh, in superfluid helium. So what do we have new to contribute in terms of investigating physics with ultra-cold atoms in this sense? Uh, some things have been done. What, are, what we have that is in fact different. Um, uh, really the key thing, and the main thing that's gonna be figuring highly in this particular talk is the fact that we have the ability to tune the interactions in the system. This is unique, uh, really allows us to do things that have not been done, cannot be done in solid state systems. And that is, as I said, gonna be the main thing I'll be focusing on. Um, changing the magnetic field uh, applied to uh, a system of lithium six atoms, uh, as uh, Giacomo went through explaining in some more detail, allows one to tune the interactions. Uh, the plot here on the left is showing the uh, inverse of the uh, Fermi momentum times the scattering length, and basically interaction parameter describing the system. For low fields, it's a molecular BEC rep you know, repulsive limit. Uh, there's a Feshbach resonance around uh, um, 80 millitesla. And at higher fields, you go into the BCS limit. For the things that we're looking at here in terms of stability of persistent currents, the right side plot is a bit more significant in thinking about what actually happens to the critical temperature as one tunes across the BEC BCS crossover. And this is again well known, but I think to make sure that the context is clear for anyone new to this, uh, the critical temperature is higher in the molecular BEC limit, which is a maximum near resonance, and then it falls off exponentially as you go into the BCS limit. And that's actually where we're gonna be focusing the primary attention in the experiments I'll be describing uh, later in the talk. Let's see, I forgot to start my timer. I'm looking at my clock here. Okay, so uh, there's a lot to be said about experimental methods. Um, 
I'll break it down into three pieces. One is what we do in terms of actually creating this ring. Um, really, those techniques are not particularly novel. There are many experiments uh, that use similar things, Giacomo uh, certainly being a, a great example. And so I'll, I'll mostly just mention what we have so that uh, it's, it's clear and more to the point, explain the detailed parameters of the ring potential that we are going to use or have used for these experiments so that you know what we, what we actually have in hand. Uh, a little bit more time talking about how we create currents. This is a broader subject and there is some more complication doing this with fermions, although it's not tremendously different in the end from the way one would need to do it with bosons. Uh, the big difference really is in the detection process. Uh, and I'll have to describe the procedure that, well, procedures that we have used to detect currents, what those allow us to do, what maybe they don't quite allow us to do yet, uh, and show some examples of how that works. And then I'll get to talking about the experiments. Okay. Um, I haven't ever really talked about the general layout of this experiment in any context, and I'm not going to do that here either. Uh, maybe just a single slide to give those who are more expert in this a, a quick sense of, of uh, what the background for producing these gases is, that we have a, a 2D MOT uh, as the main source. And in fact, it's a lithium-6, lithium-7 dual species 2D MOT. Um, we capture the atoms in a 3D MOT. Uh, gray molasses transferred to a, I have my pointer, don't I? I'm just having laser pointer. So uh, essentially capture and cool here, transport the atoms over into a glass cell. And that's really uh, the only thing we're gonna wanna focus on for the context of this talk. Uh, everything else is really irrelevant uh, to the specific experimental results I'll be focusing on. So the configuration for our experiments, uh, again, not uh, anything out of the ordinary, but just to make it uh, clear and explicit what we do have. Uh, at the moment, we're doing all red detuned trapping, although we've done some blue detuned. Um, the primary trapping potential is a horizontal sheet beam. This is standard practice. Most of the interesting stuff happens with regard to sending in beams from above and below. We have uh, an arsenal of things for doing that. Uh, in most of the work that I will be showing today, the ring was actually created using an axicon uh, approach to projection, but we also have a DMD and we're actually using that more heavily now. Um, also another thing that figures heavily is we have a blue detuned beam uh, coming down from above steered by a 2D, uh, a 2D acoustic optic deflector. Uh, and I'll describe how that's used. In fact, I guess I stuck the uh, picture here to the right showing what the atoms look like in the sheet when they're at uh, high temperature and that uh, barely visible tiny uh, hole off center there is the, the two micron spot of our stirring beam piercing that cloud. Uh, just to give you an idea of, of approximate scales before we actually do evaporation. Um, so in this talk, I'm not going to go too far afield into talking about the many types of things one could do with different geometries. And I'll maybe get to that at the end a bit uh, and see how many questions there are with regard to that. Uh, really most of the work we've done so far has been in single ring and concentric double ring geometry. And so I will just describe what our single ring really is uh, because there actually are some subtle details about this that we didn't realize when we started these experiments mattered to what we were going to see. Okay, so um, when one puts fermions in a sheet trap and turns on a ring potential, uh, we start off with both of those beams on at maximum power. We see better evaporation efficiency with the ring present as is usually expected for any kind of a dimple trap. Uh, seems to be no exception for a ring dimple. Um, we have to have a fairly deep trap where the atoms are at something like 30 micro Kelvin when we bring them in from the transport beam. So there's four watts in that sheet to start with and we bring it down to something like 30 milliwatts by the time we finish evaporating. Um, this also may be good to point out, this is a fairly small number of atoms. It's a small ring, uh, tightly confined. Uh, the number of atoms we work with ranges maybe between 1,000 and 15,000, depending on what we're doing. I think that was all I wanted to see on that slide. Um, again, for kind of reference of what this looks like as you're practically working with it, uh, characterizing what we've got uh, involves uh, releasing the system at a time of flight. So here's some pictures showing what this looks like from a top view as you're decreasing the trap depth. The final trap depth in our case is 
uh, 2.7 microkelvin, about half of which is due to the ring beam, and the other half is uh, due to the sheet beam. And uh, as you can see from the side, even though it's not apparent from above, there is a significant population sitting out there kind of in the wings outside the, the ring potential. That's important for more reasons than we realized. For this context, it's uh, just important to point out that uh, fitting that expanding thermal component is uh, how we extract the temperature, at least have some idea of what the temperature is in the system as, as we get down to low temperatures. Um, yeah. All right, so vital statistics on the trap. Uh, again, we've, we've done many configurations. This is kind of the standard thing. If you want to think about, it. we most commonly do this. This is about what it looks like. Uh, the average diameter of the ring, something like 24, 25 microns. Uh, if you think about the mass of a lithium pair and that uh, radius, that gives you an azimuthal frequency for the lowest persistent current state of five hertz or a velocity of, of uh, 0.44 uh, millimeters per second. So it's very low velocities. Uh, a little bit of something to point out here that is different, certainly from anything I've built before, is that the, the trap frequencies are much higher. And in fact, the horizontal trap frequency is considerably higher than the vertical trap frequency. So in this case, the ring really is a little bit more of a wedding band, wedding band geometry, if you like, rather than a, a flat washer. And we actually have done things where you ramp the, the sheet fully off and we can actually trap the atom suspended in a cylindrical uh, uh, you know, extended cylindrical ring. Uh, maybe I'll come back to talking about it at the end of the, the talk if uh, it seems appropriate. Um, okay, sheet depths or the trap depths already said something about that. Um, that of course sets the approximate temperature scales and Fermi energies. I'll return to that. A um, few more vital statistics because I think it is important to compare really what the difference is here in some sense between what one would get with a bosonic system and a fermionic system. But there are some things that are different and more challenging for that reason. Um, and <laughs> I originally had a slide that had comparisons with many more uh, Bose groups and they decided in the end that that was just uh, too much information. So this is really an unfair comparison against results from NIST in 2012, but this is my own result. So I, it's not bad if I say I'm making it look bad. Um, so on this chart, uh, the things I think I'd point out particularly, and we have a very uh, high aspect ratio on this. That's not completely unique. The results at ENS recently, uh, you know, they have things that look just as impressive with uh, their Bose gas there, which has really been fun to see that. Uh, but a distinction is that the chemical potential uh, is higher here, order of magnitude higher when you have a Fermi gas. And from a experimental practical standpoint, that matters, that should become more clear shortly. Uh, also higher sound speeds, uh, that means phonon frequencies, everything associated with that kind of physics is scaled higher in energy. And again, this is lithium, it's lighter. And so for a given uh, ring radius, we have larger spacings between those uh, persistent current energy levels. Um, I'm gonna take a minute and talk about what one might think that you would have if you had a an overly idealized picture of what the system really looks like and start off by saying this is not really a good way of thinking about what we've done and I'll show why. But at some level, if you imagine a perfectly flat ring and you know, being realistic for ultra cold atoms, you say you've got transverse harmonic confinement and here just for simplicity, assume it's the same horizontal and vertical, you can very easily go through and, and for an uh, ideal Fermi gas figure out what the Fermi energy is going to be as a function of uh, atom number. And it's maybe interesting to note that when you're uh, in the range of what we're working with, this is not a smooth function. And the density of states, in fact, does end up being modulated as you hit the successive bands associated with the transverse modes in the ring. Uh, this is for fairly low atom number, but not that much lower than where we've actually been working. Um, Point this out a little bit because these sorts of modulations in the density of states are known to be important in 1D superconductors. This is this kind of engineering of the density of states is used in uh, creating 1D organic superconductors to try to raise the critical temperature. Now, we're not at this right now, but uh, something maybe good to note that people might have not realized. Um, and as I said, this is not really a good way of describing the ring that I just showed you that we have in our experiment. 
uh, we in fact have more atoms in there and we do not have a, a harmonic trap that goes up to infinity on the sides. Uh, we have a dimple and in fact, we've overfilled the dimple and we found out somewhat by accident that it really was actually important that we overfilled the dimple uh, in order to have a, a better phase coherence around the ring. It's actually easier to do the sorts of things I'm gonna show you when you do fill up beyond the dimple and have some population out in the broader uh, sheet region. Um, the graphic at the left here is sort of showing the trap contours that uh, there's significant depth there in the ring, that vertical propagating beam, but there's a broad, uh, there's that, that broad uh, uh, disc region is still there. And we typically still have atoms there. In fact, uh, for the conditions in the, the paper now on the archive, uh, about two thirds of the atoms are sitting off in that halo, although you really can't see them very well if you just look at it from the absorption images. Uh, this means that uh, you know, we've got up to about 12,000 atoms in that ring, but the Fermi energy doesn't really change that much with the number of atoms in the trap uh, when, we're, when we're up at that level. The capacity, if you like to say it that way, of, of the dimple, uh, how many atoms you can actually fit in there before you start filling, uh, spilling out into the sheet is something on the order of uh, a few thousand, again, depending on exactly how tightly we're confining in there and how deeply we get the trap. Um, okay, so what is essential? We tune the interactions and the atoms redistribute because of the change of the chemical potential. That's probably uh, not too unexpected. Um, okay, so I already mentioned about the fact that the critical temperature varies as we tune the interactions. I will skip talking about how smooth it is. Mostly, I'd just say it's not that much of a problem. Uh, adding disorder could be interesting. Um, actually, fortunately, I probably don't need to talk about this too much. Um, well, so I will say that we do see currents form spontaneous in the system uh, quite readily. Uh, and in fact, we have to stop the currents if we want to guarantee that we initialize the system in a well-defined state. Uh, we do that using the same beam that we use to stir the system up to some particular angular velocity. Um, I do want to say here that this is a little bit more difficult because of uh, we have found this is much more sensitive. It, it's difficult to reliably initialize the system uh, because it is easier to have a phase fluctuating uh, situation where the you, you break the ring and and pull the barrier back out again. And if there's enough phase fluctuation between those ends of the ring, uh, you, it is difficult to make sure you reliably do that. Um, I'll keep that short because I do want to get to the final result. Okay, so we have done some things with looking at exactly uh, how one, uh, exactly how the response works when you are close to the transition uh, from one state to another. Uh, you know, it's not as interesting to talk about exactly how we do the protection. I thought I was going to talk about this some more. I can make this a long story short. Um, if you just release the atoms directly into time of flight, uh, as I said, the, the Fermi energy is high. These things pretty well explode. The, uh, the Fermi wavelength is much smaller than the resolution limit. You can't see anything, even if there is some coherent feature going on, like a vortex core. So we have to ramp into the uh, weakly interacting BEC limit and actually relax the trap in order to be able to see uh, the signature of a current in time of flight, which you can see here at the bottom of the slide, just shows up as a vortex. And I think you know, these are these are well enough known things now that let's get to the more interesting stuff. Okay, so what we did that was a little unusual was take advantage of the fact that we could tune the interactions in the system. We started off near unitarity, stirred the system up into the L equals one current state, which we're, and we can do it very reliably under that, those circumstances. And then it's, we know that the critical temperature falls off exponentially in the BCS limit. So start ramping the magnetic field to uh, see what happens and how far we can get before the current decays and maybe what happens. Uh, we have to go back into the superfluid state to know if, uh, but we have to go back to the molecular BC limit to know whether or not the, the current decayed. And so uh, our procedure is basically to you know, ramp up to high field, hold for some duration of time, and then come back down to low field and perform the current detection. Um, when we do that, we found that going up to fields as high as 98 millitesla, you know, one over minus 
one over KFA of minus one, uh, you know, well into BCS, the current was very stable. Uh, we, we essentially saw no evidence of decay after a fair number of, of shots. Uh, going beyond that, we did see that we, we were beginning to lose the current occasionally. And at the moment, the thinking is that that's, uh, as uh, remember, we're, we're changing the critical temperature and the system temperature is staying more or less constant through this range. So uh, this is what's happening with uh, essentially thermally activated uh, phase lips or thermal, uh, uh, yeah, thermal fluctuations suppressing the, the order parameter at some location allowing the current to decay. If one goes higher, uh, back up there, you should eventually, I guess I forgot to say that that dotted red line at the bottom is indicating what we think the system temperature is. And we think that that's what it is based on where we see a sudden fall off in the probability that you're going to see the persistent current reappear when you go back into the superfluid phase. Um, we were initially a little bit puzzled that when we went really well into the BCS limit, that this didn't just go to zero. I, didn't really have a good idea of how quickly the normal current would in fact decay, but I had thought it would be maybe faster than this, um, but it was not. Uh, well, at least what we, what we saw was that even for going well into the BCS limit and staying there for hundreds of milliseconds and then coming back into the superfluid uh, phase after being presumably normal, we still had a fairly high probability of seeing the supercurrent uh, show up again. Um, and I'll, I'll wrap up in maybe one more minute. So we, we took a look to see whether this was due to spontaneous current formation and uh, showed that it was not, but we in fact uh, have done some preliminary work seeing that we, we do see uh, spontaneous currents forming at an increased rate when we do sweep across the transition as expected. This is kibble zurich uh, physics most likely. We've got to do this more systematically to say something uh, more definite about it. Um, I've actually hit on some of this uh, along the way. We have a lot of ideas for things to do, but I think I will uh, call it off there. Uh, thank the students who worked very hard to pull off much of this in spite of COVID <laughs> and uh, uh, take questions. Probably the one thing I should explain about this plot that I didn't mention is why uh, if we are in fact not having normal, if, if the current is not decaying, uh, rapidly when we go into the normal phase, why are we seeing the probability of the uh, quantized current after coming back into the superfluid sit at around 0.3? Uh, that baffled us for a little bit, but uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, most of the atoms in the system, when we prepare the current, are not in the ring dimple. They're outside of it, and we don't stir them. So we've got a Two thirds of the system that's in the normal phase and uh, is presumably not circulating. Again, maybe depending a bit on damping. Mm -hmm. uh, so when we uh, are in fact in the normal phase and you want to come back into the, the superfluid mm -hmm. phase, the average angular momentum per atom is presumably somewhere uh, around uh, 0.3 h bar. Um, this raises a lot of questions about what exactly is happening in terms of dynamics and equilibration between the different populations. You know, the superfluid going normal, uh, the normal component that used to be superfluid interacting with whatever the non-rotating uh, normal component was. Uh, but essentially, if, if that normal component is still rotating, you would expect to have uh, it come back. Uh, in the simple picture of the Hess-Fairbank effect, if you have uh, circulation uh, corresponding to an angular momentum per particle greater than uh, 0.5 h bar, you would think you would come into the L equals one current state with high probability. Below that, you should go into L equals zero. Fluctuations in our system likely wash that out. I kind of showed that in the earlier slides that this is not a zero temperature system by any means, and it's fairly high aspect ratio. So we're presuming that the, the uh, actual uh, probability of coming back into a particular state is being broadened out and made more linear as a function of what the average angular momentum per particle is. But we do need to look at that a little more carefully um, moving forward. Uh, I think that does at least give a chance to talk about one of the things I am interested in looking at going forward. There is this question of equilibration. Uh, I mean, no one's really done anything quite like this before. And in fact, even the question of start a system, certainly like put a current in a ring 
and then do a kibbles or a quench, what is supposed to happen and how is that different, if at all, from uh, starting off with an initial state that is non-rotating? Or if you start off with something which is frankly not even an equilibrium state, uh, where that angular momentum is not distributed evenly between regions of the trap. What is supposed to happen? I don't know. Um, might be interesting to look at. Um, so we'd like to, in the near future, uh, tighten this down a bit and see how much further into the quasi 1D limit we can go. We've got clear indications that we're at the edge of the thermal phase uh, fluctuating regime. If we, in fact, evaporate down, as I said, that we don't have atoms out in that uh, sheet region, uh, it actually becomes very diff difficult to prepare the atom in a well-defined current state, I think because of these fluctuations, uh, let alone to actually then detect what's going on. I should maybe make the point though that even though we're in the thermal phase fluctuating limit, assuming we do get in there, the winding number around the system should still be well-defined, uh, uh, even, even if it is a quasi-condensate effectively, maybe in, in the molecular BC limit, as long as a thermal fluctuation doesn't drive the superfluid component uh, to zero somewhere, we should still see stability in the winding number, even if the coherence around the ring is, is being negatively impacted by phase fluctuations. Um, I have not watched the clock. I'm sure I'm running out of time now. But, uh, yeah, I think it's so. time to, uh, to move on to questions. Thank you. Yes, okay, well, so. thanks for the couple minutes extra. Okay, so uh, either raise your hand or type a question in the Q&A. Uh, Gerhard Berkel. <clears throat> Thanks, Kevin, for this wonderful talk and the great results. Um, I'm really fascinated by um, the this, this strong connection you mentioned about needing the atoms outside the ring, but in the sheet. Because usually you think those guys are disturbing the whole system, but it seems that in your case they are stabilizing the system. Could you could you give us an idea why this is so important in your case to have those additional atoms? Well, so it may be. I mean, it's a question of. Uh, it may be a bit of a, a question of, of asking about what the effective dimensionality of the system is, or you know, having having the system be more fully three D and having a larger aspect ratio um, should result in fewer fluctuations. Um, yeah, I, I think I'm not, not certain. I mean, there's an increased density of states there. There, there are certainly more states available. Uh, there, there are more atoms present at the Fermi level um, when you have filled up into the regime of, of, uh, of the sheet and filled up the dimple. Um, so that, that's still a little bit, I, I'm guessing there. Um, I, I can't say that I, I've got a, a concrete way of backing it up. I, I just can say that when we lower the atom number to the point that we eliminate that halo, we do see significantly changed behavior in the system. You know, it, it doesn't look like what it might if it was a hard walled system with basically the same peak density. I mean, maybe coming back at like, shouldn't we be able to say local density approximation and, and decide what's going to go on in the in the ring dimple based on that. That's kind of what I would have thought. Um, this is making me want to think about that a little harder. Mm. So probably you mentioned it, but what is the relative uh, ratio between the numbers in the ring and the numbers in the sheet? Uh, for the for the experiments that I've mostly showed these results for, it's uh, uh, two to one. So basically two thirds that are out in that halo. And maybe I should move my slides back just to that. that. I think I did go past. Um, so you, you really can't see them very well by eye from those absorption images taken from above. But if you look carefully and integrate, uh, you can see there is this broad dilute background. So I mean, in some sense, this is like, if you like, you've got a uh, superfluid with a much higher critical temperature that's a ring embedded in a disc mm. that is a super, I mean, that has a, a lower critical temperature, in fact, below the system temperature. So what, what role does that play in things? I, I, it's, it's an interesting thing to think about. I did not expect that we would need to do this mm -hmm. uh, in order to have this work nicely. Mm -hmm. it, that's, that's why I think it's very interesting to, to dwell on that because this is a very unique, unique system. Now, okay. The dimple aspect really took us by surprise. It was not something I had in mind when we started doing this. Mm -hmm. So thanks a lot. <laughs> 